Hello and welcome to Factually. I'm Adam Conover. Thank you so much for joining me on the show once again. You know, these days it seems like everybody wants to go to Mars. Every president, going back at least to George H.W. Bush, has made some sort of statement in favor of exploring Mars and getting good old American space boots on that Martian ground. Elon Musk has been more than vocal about wanting to settle Mars for years now in order to save humanity, which seems pretty bleak if that's what we're resorting to, but whatever. Putting aside narratives of nationalist glory and the savior fantasy of one of the worst and stupidest people on the planet, I have a very important question when it comes to human settlement on Mars or any other planet, really. Why? Like, seriously, why? Because it would be cool? I mean, it would certainly satisfy my childhood science fiction fantasies, but what substantive purpose would it actually serve? And the issue of why only gets bigger when you weigh it against what I imagine to be the immense and incredible resources and effort required to make it happen. And I don't say that just to poo-poo it. I just wonder, is space colonization a good or realistic idea? I mean, when you think about what it would actually take to actually do it, is it something we actually want to do? We need to ask this question. Well, our guests today have spent years researching the answer and writing a fascinating, entertaining, and funny book exploring just that question. But before we get to it, I just want to remind you that if you want to support this show, you can do so on Patreon. Head to patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Five bucks a month gets you every episode of this podcast ad-free. And by the way, if you want to see me do stand-up comedy, I got a brand new hour that I am touring around the country this January. Come catch me in D.C., Philly, New York City, Chicago, Atlanta, Boston, or Nashville. Head to adamconover.net for tickets and tour dates. I'd love to see you there. Now, I'm a strong believer that you can only really understand something by getting into the details and by examining the how of human space exploration and colonization. We might get a better sense of the why. So, our guests today are the wife-husband duo of Dr. Kelly Wienersmith and Zach Wienersmith. Their new book is A City on Mars, Can We Settle Space, Should We Settle Space, and Have We Really Thought This Through? Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Kelly and Zach Wienersmith. Kelly and Zach, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks for having us. Okay, so there's been a whole lot of billionaires the past 10 years or so saying, we need to build a city on Mars or some other planet that humans must become a multi-planetary species. Uh, what do you think? You've spent a lot of time researching this. Should we become multi-planetary or not? And why or why not? Well, that's a huge question, really. But, uh, right, and I expect you to answer it very briefly, and it's going to be a short podcast. Oh, yeah. oh you, you, you got the wrong guests on your show then. Uh, but so, so, you know, we, we hope, I hope, that we become multiplanetary at some point, but I hope that we don't do it quickly, because doing it quickly has all sorts of ethical geopolitical problems, uh, including the fact that we don't even know if we can safely have babies in space yet. So you'd essentially be doing, like, human experimentation on Mars if you just go out there and have babies. So that's sort of a dark angle to start things on, but, uh, you know, it's... it's uh... Wait, so, well, let's, I'm sorry, I have to drill into this immediately. Yeah. Now, when you say babies in space, you mean space or on another planet, um, right? So we don't know what it would be like. We don't know what would happen if you had a baby on Mars. What could go wrong? Well, so these billionaires that you talked about at the beginning of the show, uh, they are proposing yeah. that, you know, for example, Elon Musk is saying that we need to go to Mars so that we can be multiplanetary. So if anything happens to Earth, there's a backup of humanity. So if you're going to have... Right. But he loves, we know that he loves having babies. So many he babies. has so many kids. Yeah. And so if he, goes, <laughs> if he goes to Mars, you know, Elon's going to be fucking and Elon's going to want to have a lot of kids with weird names. <laughs> he he right? could people a settlement on his own, almost certainly. <laughs> with that one generation, you get inbreeding problems in generation two, <laughs> yeah, which will be the musclings. I mean, bring a lot. Well, anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. We don't back okay. it up. So we, you know, we don't understand much about how space radiation impacts human bodies, let alone babies when they're developing. So most of our research mm. has been done on the International Space Station, and they're protected from space radiation by the magnetosphere. And so space radiation is different than what you experience on Earth. We don't understand how bad it is. I was actually, oh, yeah, I, I was at a the, so. Yeah. 
uh, you mean the magnetos the magnetosphere, which is around the uh -huh. Earth, right? There, so they're still protected by the Earth's sort of natural space radiation protection when the when they're when they're on the International Space Station. They say they're in space, but no, they're inside the magnetosphere. But on Mars, you wouldn't be protected by that. I'm sorry, I cut you off. I mean, I impressed but you're right they're not getting all of space. They, they're officially in space they're okay. they're according there's a technical definition according to which they they are astronauts yeah okay, but, uh, okay. But, but they're just they're just doing it on easy mode is all we're saying <laughs> <laughs> all right i love i love it when people shade astronauts on this show <laughs> uh, we're, we we can go there in a big they way lie about their memoirs. they're liars what? astronauts are liars, astronauts are liars? we we started collecting admitted lies in astronaut memoirs and we we had a whole section the editor made us cut it short because it was so long we had to just summarize astronauts lying the reason they lie is because they're like especially in the early days they're mostly test pilots all they want to do is fly all they want to do is go in space there was a guy named walter cunningham he was an astronaut in the 70s he thought he was having a heart attack the day before launch while maybe having bone cancer and he hid everything he went to like a secret doctor found by a fixer so he wouldn't have to tell nasa staff that's just one example uh <laughs> mike Mullane, mike Mullane pulled papers out of his medical record uh just, just, like, because the idiots uh in charge of uh of medical stuff thought they could trust an astronaut which you cannot wow never trust an astronaut that's you the first lesson of the astronaut. podcast <laughs> Holy shit. That's a movie. That's a movie all by itself. But okay, let's go back to the baby's quiz. I don't want to derail too much. Yes. yes. Kelly, you were explaining. Well, so I was at this working group and they had a biology group with all these like medical experts who were talking about, well, what would you need to have babies in space? And the woman in charge was saying you should have artificial wombs so that you can protect the babies from space radiation because it could be that bad. And needless to say, we don't have artificial wombs yet. And so maybe we shouldn't be doing this yet. And also, like, so the astronauts on the International Space Station, they lose every month 1.5% of aerial bone mineral density. So this is how you measure osteoporosis. Uh, Whoa. And every month they're losing that from their hips. And so, like, I don't want, I wouldn't want to be the woman who had spent 20 years growing up on Mars hoping that partial gravity is enough and hoping that when labor kicks in, my hips are going to hold up. Like, that doesn't sound so awesome. So... Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot we yeah. don't know. Mm -mm. Well, when when you say yeah. just having babies on Mars, I was imagining birth or what you said, like you know, fetal stuff, fetal development. But then when you point out, okay, if an adult on the International Space Station is losing 1.5 percent bone density or whatever every single what month. year, month, every month, okay, and then well, hold on a second. That means I really don't want to fucking grow up there from ages like zero mm -mm. to 25. What the hell is going to happen to me? Am I going to have bones at is all? It, that's a very good observation. So we, when, we, when we talk about this, we tend to talk about can you have babies, which, which I think we, we believe probably it'd be dangerous, but you could do it. But then the kids have to grow up. And so, for example, on Mars, the soil, which kicks up in dust storms, has a thyroid hormone disruptor in it at high percentage. Whoa! So what does that do to teenagers or babies? Or we we don't even if it's we don't even know if it's safe for adults. But you imagine like you've got a ten year old. It's just crazy. And th and that's again just one among many problems we don't have the answer to because we don't take children and expose them to like high doses of perchlorate uh, for fun or or science because it would be you know you monstrous. Got, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel like you guys have researched this so heavily. We're already down the rabbit hole on a very specific problem of being on Mars, which is you're like, hey, guess what? The dust has a high concentration of a thyroid disruptor. OK, that's fine. What the fuck do they eat up there, Zach? They're on fucking Mars. Where's the water so, coming from? Are they what, what they live in a bubble? Like, what the fuck? Uh, tell me about the basics. Are those even possible? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, well, uh, we don't know. This is like one of the major problems. So the best data we have on how to build uh, a sort of ecosystem in a sealed bubble, which is what you'd want on Mars, because Mars is awful and will kill you. Uh, the best data we have is from Biosphere 2, from the 90s, you know, that Polly Shore movie? Oh, yeah. Biodome. I visited yeah. I visited the Biosphere 2 um, uh, with a family road trip, like, out west. I don't know if you can still do it now, but at the time, I was like, you can go visit the Biosphere 2. And it was sort of like, yeah, here was this dome that we built out west, and we put some scientists in it for a while to see if they could live in a self-contained environment. And uh, basically, what happened? Didn't they all go crazy and start fucking each other? Isn't that what happened? Uh, 
Uh, yes, I mean, I'm sure, yes. Yeah, it, it didn't, but, but it didn't I, go I, well. That was my memory I, I, of what they told us when we visited it. So, 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 I will, first, a slight correction, I would say it was not scientists. It was people the slightly cultish leader thought were cool. Oh, okay. Was, okay. Got it. All right. All right. Understood. <laughs> I think one or two were scientists, but, but mostly it was like people, John Allen, who is kind of like a proto Steve Jobs, thinks they're cool right uh -huh. now. So um, this was by and that, at yeah. its start a fucked up project by a megalomaniac. Got it. Uh, and a billionaire. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, so we just, with if Elon Musk was in charge, you could just have a two for one. Um, <laughs> but like, uh, 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 yes, you're right. So by the end, they were starving. Uh, at one point, they had to have oxygen piped in because they were like running out of it. Uh, you know, and humans like oxygen. Um, and and the other thing is, and this is important for your like Utopia Mars plan, they spent almost all of their time working like just to run the farm and not die. And they were eating like green bananas and beans meant for goats. And they had to kill their pigs because the pigs weren't surviving and the chickens wouldn't lay eggs. It was kind of a disaster. And they split, there were eight people, they split into two groups. And at one point there was a drive-by spitting by one group on the other. Uh, and so they didn't literally didn't speak to each other for a year during the two year voyage. So, wow, that is a source of data. And it's for eight people, not the million people Elon Musk would like. And, and it didn't it didn't go well. That sort of like contained environment, growing your own food right. like uh, we're going to we're going to create a sustainable environment for human life. It, it, it has it, not worked. It didn't go well. There have been follow up experiments like Japan and China have had smaller facilities where they're trying to do the same thing with two or three people. But where we are on that right now is like in China, they had three big guys in the facility and they started running out of oxygen. So they had to switch out two of the big guys for two smaller women, which is like, <laughs> so that's where we are right now. You can't do those swaps if you're on Mars. Yeah. We have not figured these equations out yet. We shouldn't be sending people yet. But, but wait, are there, uh, so you guys are saying very firmly, we shouldn't be sending people yet. Is someone trying to send people now? Because when Elon says it at this point, I'm just like, that guy just says shit. I don't believe anything he says. Right. But are yes. there yes. It, it, are there people who you think are trying to do it too soon? Uh, I would say, you know, Musk is probably the main one pushing. He's trying to build the vehicle to do it now. There are a lot of advocates who are pushing it soon. Uh, probably the most prominent is a guy named Robert Zubrin. He's one of the founders of the Mars Society. Um, he would like to see boots on Mars very soon. There are people who are pushing to get to the moon faster as part of like a space race with China yes. and maybe set up research stations that could become settlements. But I agree. I don't think there's any chance of us actually getting to the moon and starting a settlement. Maybe we'll do some research in the next couple of decades, but I don't think we're going to be starting a settlement anytime soon, despite what Musk says. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's mostly a fantasy. And, and, and the interesting thing is like, what, what, how is the fantasy used to get people to do things? Right. That's so that's the interesting question is. There's sort of two things going on. There's people who say we should go to Mars and they have a justification for why they think we should go. Mm -hmm. And we could debate what that justification is. You know, Musk says he wants to save us from natural disaster or whatever, become a multi multiplanetary species there. And, you know, I, I know that the government has before said, oh, let's send people to Mars for X, Y and Z reason. But then there's also the actual reasons that people might might want such a program to exist, which yes. might involve personal enrichment, uh, you know, some sort of national propaganda campaign, yeah. um, maybe just, you know, hey, wouldn't it be great to spend a couple hundred billion dollars on anything that, you know, the uh, military industrial uh, complex could build for us because a lot of people would get, get rich off of that, um, et cetera. Which do you think is more driving the push to go to Mars, the good faith reasons or the uh, ulterior motives? Well, prestige is definitely what sent us to the moon. I think, you know, sure. so that the US government isn't pushing for settlements on Mars right now. And so I'd say, you know, maybe you don't have to choose amongst any of those. I really think that Elon Musk does care about making the species multiplanetary. He's been like into this kind of stuff since he was very young. Same thing with Jeff Bezos. So I, you know, I believe, I think they're wrong, but I believe that their intentions are maybe beyond making a dollar. Um, they're sincere. I think they're sincere. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. They're, they're true yeah, believers. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, yeah. I would, in terms of like the, the using of space settlement, I mean, I think I would add that for, I, I believe Elon Musk is absolutely a true believer. I do think these kind of fantastic ideas really help onboard young engineers uh, mm -hmm. and, and get them to work uh, 23 hours a day. So I, I do think that is part of what's going on. 
Um, uh, but actually, like, like Kelly says, the government's not spending very much on settlement. I do think there's a good case that human spacefaring is in general almost always for PR purposes, and then the scientific aspects are pretty questionable. Um, and, you know, I could go into like the history of that, but um, but but there's a great book by Alex McDonald, who I think is the NASA chief economist, called "The Long Space Age." Like, basically arguing that the main reason we do stuff like humans to space is because it signals power to other nations. It's like a way to declare yourself a superpower. Right. Of course. And it's, well, you know, also, I'm one of those people where, in terms of humans going to space, you know, uh, you know, Neil Armstrong and them on the moon, it's just fucking <laughs> sick. I mean, like, we got... <laughs> Like it's, it was, it was sick. It was awesome. Yeah. You know, like it, it was awesome. It was yeah. great. We sent people across the, the great, the great expanse of vacuum and, uh, you know, and death to the thing in the sky. And then they came back. Holy shit. I mean, you know, we do a lot of stuff. <laughs> we do a lot of stuff just cause it's cool. Right. That's why we try to run a, a mile as fast as we can. That's why we do. There's a lot of things we do just because like everyone else says you can't do it. And someone's like, I want to try and and I do think there is yeah. some value in doing that, what? but I don't go disagree. For it. Like you know, the fact that we brought Apollo thirteen back is incredible. Like that was huge. And like I'm kind of a cold hearted person, but when we landed Curiosity on Mars, <laughs> I got tears in my eyes. And maybe that's the only time yeah. in the last two decades. So I get yeah. it. Can, can yeah. I can I wet blanket this <laughs> a little bit? All right. So so like one point to make at the peak budget of NASA, I think it was 1968. It was like four percent of the budget. Like so, I think like however <laughs> awesome, like you you want to you you want to you want to like like I don't know that anyone today would seriously want four percent of the budget to put two dudes on the moon. Yeah, uh, actually, Kennedy Kennedy himself before he he agreed to all you know, or pushed for all this wanted to do desalinization because he couldn't convince himself. I think correctly that going to the moon had like a lot of scientific merit. He thought desalinization would actually be valuable, but he, like their transcripts have been saying this basically like, but it won't show up the Soviets. So like we we can't we can't get Congress to open the wallet. Um, I mean, I do think like to to get into like the I don't want to get too in the weeds, but like there were proposals back in the fifties before Apollo to build like a giant space station first, and then kind of organize an armada that would go to the moon in style, right? So instead of sending two test pilots, you'd send like ten people who are like geologists and chemists and stuff, which would have at least you know whether it could be done. Set that aside. But what we actually ended up doing, basically, because Kennedy said we'd do it in a certain amount of time, is sending the tiniest possible dinghy we could to the moon that could get back people alive. Wow. So that, I mean, so that, like, I, I think that there's a historian named John Lodgeton who wrote a whole book just about Kennedy's decision making process in the in the early '60s, and it's it's PR and geopolitics at the core, and that explains why it was not done in a way that would like could be repeated. Right. So like the program gets killed sort of infamously after Apollo 17. But part of that's because it was done in this crazy, expensive, like difficult to repeat way because it was PR. It was just to do the stunt. And after it was done, people wouldn't even tune in to watch. So it's not just like bureaucrats saying, let's close this program. It's like the public in general doesn't want to spend this money. Yeah. I mean, the you're absolutely right that the initial moon landing was simply the greatest PR event of all time. I mean, not only. Not only did it happen, there was live footage of it on television. I mean, even just that technically to get live television from the moon back yeah. home is like unbelievable. Even if all you did was send, even if all you did was send a camera, it's incredible. So to then see the moment of the person walking, it's like absolutely unbelievable. But, uh, and maybe it's valuable just as PR, but it's absolutely true. That's all it is. And if you look at NASA as an organization, it talked about this a lot in our research for our show about the government called the G word. NASA is the only government department that has a good website <laughs> <laughs> because if you go to NASA.gov, they got a sick website. They got like photos and like news updates yeah. and et cetera. If you go to the website of the national weather service, which is a far more important department to the lives of everyday Americans, because it generates yes. the original weather predictions and data that all of our, all of the world's weather prediction is based on. If you go to weather.gov, yes. it looks like a GeoCities website from 1998. Um, you can get the data from it. And I do, but uh, that's because it does not have that PR mission, but you can tell if, when you go to NASA, right. that is, that is like what NASA is for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, you know, like we're NASA geeks. They do a lot of real good science. It's just that like the, the it exists for PR. Like this, this was all created, you know, as as a, a big PR move. Scientists, God bless them, load their stuff onto that cash pile. Yeah. And that's great. 
but like the cash pile exists because it shows up other countries. Yeah. But okay. What, why do we want to show up other countries? Like, okay. If, if the U S they're like, we want to show up the Soviets, who's the audience for the showing up? I mean, right. these two countries are already the biggest, baddest countries in the world. Are you trying to impress yeah. Peru? Like what's going on? You might be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there, there's a lot there. Um, so one, the public historically and to this day overestimates the value of space to uh, national economies, right? So if, if it was like 1957, Sputnik goes up, everyone, including like Khrushchev and Eisenhower, were both shocked the morning after how much people gave a shit. Wow. They thought it was like cool, but everybody was planning to put up a satellite. It was it was an international geophysical year. It was a stated goal. Soviets got there first by like, actively making this eeny weeny crappy useless satellite called Sputnik. It was just a radio transmitter on a shiny ball. Uh, and they got, they beat us by like 90 days and the public at large assumed that meant their system was not, not everybody, but it really shifted the needle on how much the public of the world thought they were winning. Meanwhile, the U S was way ahead in the actual meaningful technology of the 20th century, which was microelectronics. But you can't go to the public and be like, Hey, every year, 3% improvement in the number of transistors, you know, the public doesn't care. There's a deep overestimation of how important rockets are. And part of that is because, you know, they can kill people, right? So, like, part of Alex's, Alex McDonald's argument about human space it doesn't just show that you're rich. It doesn't just show that you're organized and technologically advanced. It also shows you can deliver with precision objects to anywhere on giant rockets. Uh -huh. It's like the perfect signaling technology. The other thing I would add it, this is often forgotten the period of decolonization that happened in the 20th century, the high mark of that is 1945 to 1975. Uh. The space race occurs right in the middle of it. So there's a huge number of new nations. It literally, like the number of countries during that period multiplies by something like four or five. We have the numbers in our book. Wow. So like, th that is the audience for this. Got right? it. And that's, that's why. I, it's like, so, hey, so, so, hey so, you, you, our flag isn't flying above your Capitol building anymore, but we're still fucking in charge. Don't mess up. Like we're, we're the ones on the moon and you are not. Right. I got or, it. or look at how great our system is. You know, the socialist system can't yeah. get you. Communism can't get you there. But capitalism got you there. Right. So you should be capitalist yeah. like us, too. Which is ironic because it's not like NASA is capitalist. Like it's a huge government funded. Yeah. Like it's a socialist <laughs> enterprise. And I, 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 I mean, you know, we've 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 uh, privatized a lot of space flights since then with SpaceX and everything else. But like the, that shit ain't going to the moon. I guess. Well, there the, maybe that is why. Elon is now declaring that he wants to do it because he's, uh, you know, it's it's capitalism trying to advertise itself, right? We're going to make money by starting a settlement or by going up there. Um, so it's a little bit of the same yes. logic. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Like I said, I, th I think you know, rocket science is absolutely hard. I couldn't do it, but but it is it, as as an important economic factor. Like an economist will tell you, like, well, advanced algorithms for shopping at Walmart are really what drove ec economic growth. But the public thinks it's things like rockets, right? And, and 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 not that they don't matter. Like I'm talking to you on on Starlink, we, which I have like complex feelings wow, about. Wow, are, are yeah. you really? I mean, we live in the country. It's it's the only option. I'm I, I'm prepared to make fun of Elon Musk while defending Starlink. <laughs> I, I've got complex feelings about Thanks. it. <laughs> well, Starlink is very complex technology. With the yeah, astronomers are all pissed off about Starlink, right? Because it's yeah. uh, where the the orbit is so low that it's like fucking fucking up the night sky even more than it's already fucked up for their purposes. Yeah, but you know. Especially, you know, especially, you know, coming out of COVID, there were all those kids who needed to be able to zoom into their classrooms and stuff like we didn't have a lot of options. We're in the middle of nowhere. We couldn't afford the like yeah. 40K we needed to trench Comcast up to our house. And so we got Starlink yeah. and it, you know. We're the only people who are like, man, I miss Comcast. <laughs> That's what it's like to be in the country. That's how bad it is in, in the country. You, 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 what right, did I ever but, have a problem with Comcast you know, I'll for? Just, I'll just say, and I've talked about it on this show before, that, you know, for instance, when, you know, the, the federal government decided in when the, the 40s or so that everyone in the country should have electricity, well, they just embarked on yeah. a big rural electrification project and forced all the electric companies to run the fucking lines yeah. out there because guess what? It's not that expensive. Just fucking do it so that everyone in the country can yeah. get electricity. And like, we could do that without sending yep. thousands of satellites up to fuck up the night sky. We could just like run some goddamn pipe, just get some fi fiber optic cable is cheap, motherfuckers. Yeah, I, 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 I let me, I will 90% agree with what you're saying because like, it, it's absolutely true that the government has repeatedly paid local companies to run trench out and they just, they seem to not do it. It does seem to slowly get having the FCC allocates billions for it, but yeah, like why isn't it, like something like 10% of Americans, though this is shrinking now, have crappy internet. 
And so that, that has created this gap into which Starlink has jumped. I will say that's true in the US. I don't think it's true in like recently electrified rural India, where I think Starlink would actually be quite valuable mm-hmm. um, in, in a way like, like that, that, you know, in a way that would be hard to reproduce by just saying, let's build out infrastructure to a billion people. Well, India has uh, infrastructure problems all over the place. Like, yeah. a, you know, I, I'm yeah. certainly not saying anything that I say about American infrastructure should hold in India, but I'm just making yeah. the point about, you know, the, the, sol- the solutions that we choose sure. are choices that we make. They're not inevitabilities. Um, and there are often options that are a little bit more sustainable or at least don't uh, fuck up our view of, you know, Alpha Centauri or whatever. <laughs> sure. um, yeah. But let's, let's get yeah. back to space colonization, space settlement, whatever you want to call it. Um, is, is there in your view, how about this? What is the best argument for why it should be done in your view? So we propose two arguments that we think are, are the best, but probably the best of the best is this, you know, long-term plan B. So, you know, Elon Musk wants us to have a million people on Mars in the next two to three decades. And he claims that's going to be a backup for humanity. But like if, if earth in the next two to three decades tanks, Mars is only a couple years behind, maybe only a couple weeks behind. Like in order to make that self-sustaining, that is the work of generations. And so if you're willing to say you like humans and some of my favorite people are humans, uh, then, then maybe you <laughs> want to like start this prog- or this process, get it rolling so that maybe in like a hundred years or something like that, you can have a self-sustaining society on Mars. So if something happens on Earth, humans will persist. We feel like that's a pretty good argument. The other argument that we liked when we started the book was it's awesome and who has any right to tell you no. But by the end, by the end of the book, we thought that was a really bad argument because going out to places <laughs> like the moon uh, could start space races, you know, between like nuclear wielding powers like China and the United States. And, ah. and so going out does create some existential threat for us back here on Earth. And so it's not just something awesome that nobody has a right to tell you not to do. There's risks for the rest of us if you do it. And so so now I think our best argument is if you do it slowly and carefully, it can be a nice long term plan B for humanity in case something bad happens. But you got to be careful. Now, my understanding is that, uh, in fact, countries can't just do it if they want, because there's there's already treaties governing outer space. To some degree, right? And and what are those? I see here. What's the Outer Space Treaty of 1967? So that's through the United Nations. It's a widely ratified treaty. The U.S. and all the major spacefaring powers have signed onto it, and it essentially says that the parts that are relevant to space settlement that when you go out into space, you are not allowed to claim sovereignty over anything. So the U.S. can't land on the moon and say this is ours. Um, but and it also says that anybody who goes to space is the responsibility of some country. So if Musk were to go to Mars, Mm. the United States would be responsible for what he does when he's there. And so they need, you know, they're they're responsible to someone. But there's a lot of ambiguity. So, for example, it's not clear if you can extract resources from the moon and sell those because that's not quite sovereignty. (laughs) And so the United States has actually said that our interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty is that you can extract and sell resources. That's not sovereignty. It's fine. And this is called the art of Of course, that, that's what the United States, that's what we do. We extract resources, baby. Yes, yes. So we're not, uh, of course, that is our interpretation. Is that like, oh, it, you better believe if you can frack the moon, we are going to frack it. Yeah, and 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 that's, by the way, Obama said it and Trump said it. So like, it's the one bipartisan thing is Americans <laughs> can do whatever the hell they want in space. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the, the other thing about that. So I, th- I think most nations would agree that you're allowed to like take samples because like Apollo took samples. The Russians had some probes, a couple samples. Uh, the question is like whether that's unlimited because because you can see how if you can't claim territory, but you could do literally whatever you want. It gets absurd really fast because you could like it, it, this is like stupid, but you could literally grind up the moon and turn it into something else. And now it's yours because it's a resource you extracted. You know, it's like bizarre. Uh, and and there, there is stuff in OS in, in the Outer Space Treaty that like we said environmental husbandry, but it's kind of like, you know, please do your best and tell everyone while you're screwing up the environment, uh, you know, keep us keep us in the loop for that. Can we tell the story about why that clause went in there? Project Westward, please. So, yeah, so we were oh, worried yeah. for a while, like what would happen? <laughs> so like, we were setting off nuclear weapons in space and so was the Soviet Union. And the reason we were doing it was because it could knock out satellites and we were sort of interested as a way to like you know, take the other country's capabilities away. 
Uh, and so we were mm. worried, like, well, what if that happens? How could we continue to communicate? And we thought, well, if there were tons of needles in space, we could bounce our messages off the needles and back. Uh, and so we literally set yes. up many, 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 many tiny little needles and dispersed them. And some of them are still up there. And and so this happened around the time that the Outer Space Treaty was getting written. And so some people were like, we should probably put something in there about how if you're going to like totally screw up the space environment, you should like run that by some people first. Uh, <laughs> you're going to put hundreds of thousands of needles right, into orbit. Like, destroy satellites. And so anyway, that was a, another American project. I mean, and this is a problem. My understanding is in orbit around the Earth that there's at this point lots and lots of space debris that like uh, like leftover pieces of shit mm -hmm. that like fell off the mm -hmm. space shuttle or whatever. And it's going around really fast. And some, sometimes it'll just hit a satellite satellite and go like bang and like fuck the satellite up or like if you you know if you do a spacewalk like you could just get hit by one of these needles like is this a this is a problem i've heard is that true yeah it's a problem so eventually that stuff will deorbit and it will burn up in the atmosphere and go away but right. a bunch of people you know like when they're done with yeah. the satellite they're supposed to stick it in what's called a graveyard orbit which is so high up that it's functionally out of the way of everything and isn't going to come back down and destroy anything and, and, you know, fun fact, some of those things in the graveyard orbit are nuclear reactors. Um, but yeah, there's, there's tons of junk up there. And, you know, there's a lot of people monitoring the junk to try to make sure that the satellites don't run into each other or don't run into the junk so that we don't end up with more debris. But yes, it's becoming increasingly crowded yeah. up there. But yeah, I, I would say like, you know, if, if you go on an EVA, if you go on a, a space, flight, it's, it's not like you're going to be like dodging bullets. But like the, the, the bigger concern is that if we keep on the current trajectory, especially if people keep doing what are called ASAT tests where they explode their own satellites, then you could eventually get to a world where you get a, a problem. There's this idea called the Kessler syndrome. And the thought is you get a bunch of stuff in space and then one thing explodes and it explodes something else and you get a chain reaction and it becomes very hard to do anything. Wow. Um, we're not there yet. But the, the concern is that, you know, so like SpaceX now has, I, uh, or through Starlink, has more than half the satellites I think ever fielded. Uh, so wow. there's like, it's something like nine, th yeah. So I mean, they're small, you know, but but still. And so, but, and, and they're not nearly close to complete on their project. And meanwhile, you know, Kuiper, which is, I think, either, is it Amazon or Jeff Bezos directly? But anyway, uh, th th there's some world in which you get so much crap in space that it does become le legitimately hard to, to like launch through it or operate generally. Especially once you have multiple billionaires tossing tons of stuff up there, you know, I mean, you start to worry that right. space is going to become like, you know, just a piece of wilderness where like there's a bunch of dudes with ATVs just sort of hauling ass around and like tossing beer bottles all over the place right. and like uh, building fire pits and like, oh, I I got a tiny home out here, you know, or whatever. Space is right. I would say because space the, is awful. Yeah, they will probably die. So our joke is if you hate billionaires, you should hope they're, they've got a space plane because they'll <laughs> probably die. Uh, I would say that actually I'd be less worried about their crap than about like someone deciding like so Jeff Bezos proposes these giant like million ton orbital or Lagrange point vehicles that like like I think would be a legitimate threat to Earth uh, just to have an object that large and fast moving around space like at a high enough speed objects high enough speed high enough mass objects can hit Earth like a nuclear weapon. Um, so, you know, if, if there are just tons of independent actors in space, that's just inherently dangerous. Right. Uh, okay. Let's take a really quick break here. We'll be right back with more Kelly and Zach Wienersmith talking about all the incredible shit that you have to say, because everything <laughs> you say is fascinating to me. We'll be right back with more Dr. Kelly and Zach. Am I Doing It Wrong is a podcast from HuffPost that explores the anxieties we all have about trying to get our lives right. From tipping to apologizing, online dating to paying off credit card debt, let's face it, we're probably doing something wrong. Each week, hosts Raj Punjabi and Noah Michelson choose a different topic and enlist the help of experts and guests with big opinions to talk about the best ways to tackle everything that's constantly thrown at us. By the end of each episode, you'll be a little bit wiser, a little more confident, and a lot more equipped to do every day a little bit better. Worried you're not getting good enough sleep? Afraid you're getting ripped off whenever you buy airline tickets? Raj and Noah can help you deal with all the things in life that don't come with an instruction manual. As long as there are things to do wrong, they'll be there to help you do them better. Find Am I Doing It Wrong from HuffPost wherever you get your podcasts. Folks, for over 20 years, Fastmail has been a leader in email privacy, and it has been my personal email provider for nearly as long. 
I'm completely serious. A couple years ago, I decided to quit, you know, one of the biggest email providers, you can probably guess which one, because I was sick of them snooping through my stuff, and I signed up for Fastmail instead. And you know what? I have been a happy customer for years. I was even able to import my entire inbox from the old guy, and it imported it all perfectly. I can search all my old emails, kept all the conversations intact. It was incredible. The number one reason I use Fastmail is because of privacy. The Fastmail team believes in working for customers as people to be cared for, not products to be exploited. It is ad-free, it has no tracking, and they even provide a masked email service that protects your personal data by allowing you to create multiple throwaway email addresses that you can use when you sign up for a new website. And on top of that, Fastmail keeps me super organized. I can view my calendar, inbox, and contacts all in one app, and they have awesome productivity features like scheduled send, snooze, and custom themes, mine's very cute, okay? Fastmail even works with password managers like 1Password and Bitwarden to make it easy for you to create unique passwords for every account and safely store them on your device. It is everything I or you need in an email provider, and I think you're gonna really like it as much as I do. So, if you wanna check it out, start your 30-day free trial at fastmail.com slash factually. Break the shackles of the big guys and go with an independent email provider that actually cares about your privacy. Fastmail.com slash factually. You know, nothing is worse than losing all your data. If you're like me, even just the thought of losing years of photos, videos, and personal projects makes me short of breath. And also, if you're like me, you're ready to take steps to make sure you don't lose anything. Well, when it comes to saving data, Backblaze has got your back. They make backing up and accessing your data astonishingly easy. You can get unlimited computer backup for Macs, PCs, and businesses for just nine bucks a month. And on top of the peace of mind that your data is safely back up, you can access your backed up data from anywhere in the world using the Backblaze web app or access your backed up files on the go with both iOS and Android apps. And in case catastrophe strikes, Backblaze also offers a restore by mail option, and you can have a hard drive with all of your data shipped straight to your door. Backblaze has been recommended by the New York Times Magazine, Macworld, PC World, LifeWired, Wired, Tom's Guide, 9to5Mac, and me, because I have been a happy Backblaze customer for years before they even sponsored this podcast. It is a great product. I can vouch for that myself. So... If you want to start today, you can get a 15-day, no credit card required free trial by going to backblaze.com slash factually. That's backblaze.com slash factually. Okay, we're back with Dr. Kelly and Zach Wienersmith. Uh, we're talking about space, international law, space uh, colonization, settlement, whatever you want to call it. Um, I just, when we were talking about the space treaties, it reminded me of the one time I looked up like, hey, hold on a second, who runs Antarctica? Because, you know, Antarctica is down there. And I've always been fascinated by Antarctica. Holy shit, there's a whole continent that's so snowy, just nobody wants to do anything there. Like, we got so many people on this planet. But, you know, we're just like, nah, fuck that place. But yet, we've, but, we ha but we live in a society where everybody wants to own everything. And so someone must own this. And I looked it up. And, and all the countries on Earth, or the biggest, most powerful countries, have, like, chopped it up into, like, a pie chart where, like, each of them has, like, a quadrant like you, an arc, if you draw a line from the South Pole out, they each own like a slice, like they like they sliced Antarctica into a really skinny pizza, mm -hmm. um, into a pizza with a, with a whole bunch of slices. Um, and I find that very bizarre. Is there any comparison between that and space? Well, yeah, and, and you know, one of the things that's kind of scary is that some of those pizza, pizza, pizza slices overlap. So Chile, Argentina, and I think Britain all made claims on the same chunk of Antarctica. But somehow, despite the fact that claims had been made, we have figured out how we can manage that area peacefully. And the solution to that mm. problem was, okay, everybody, we're going to accept that you have made claims. You can't make any more claims. And we're not going to say those claims are okay, but we're all just going to like chill. We're all going to be cool. We can all have research <laughs> stations, but nobody is allowed to search for minerals and nobody is allowed to extract minerals. So there was a time when they were talking about getting mining going in Antarctica, but then like Jacques Cousteau was like, no, you can't destroy Antarctica. And all these environmental people started like speaking up good for them. And they didn't want there to be like a scramble for resources. And so they said, look, let's just decide we're not going to mine Antarctica, and this is the Antarctic Treaty System made these decisions. And now there's a wow. system where for 50 years, there's a moratorium on even looking for minerals. Science can happen there. Wow. Yeah. You can't look for minerals. You can't extract it. You can't extract krill from the ocean, but you can't go out there and look for, you know, anything in the ice. 
But let me ask something, though. Is the success of that treaty based on, is it partially because it's just really fucking hard to get minerals out of Antarctica? Because you know that if there was a whole bunch of oil there that was, like, really easy to get, that treaty wouldn't stop anybody. We, we, I think we actually, yeah, I think we disagree a little on that. Hell I'll yes. Say why. Tell me why, um, please. So two things. Like, one, we do get oil from really tough environments, like in the Gulf, like at the bottom of the sea, the North Sea. That's a very tough place to operate. We figured out a way to do it. There was some evidence. So like Kelly said, you're not even allowed under what's called the Madrid Protocol of 1998. You're not even allowed to look for resources in Antarctica. And But there's some evidence from before then, like uh, in the 70s, that maybe there were actually gettable minerals in Antarctica. And the concern, there are basically two concerns, one of which is that you could start an international fight because, as you said, there, there are these slices, but there are also like research bases of other countries in those slices. And then there are overlapping slices, like countries literally sent women to have birth in their slices to kind of prove ownership. Um, and so the concern was you get war and then, yeah, there's a big environmental outcry. There's, there's a corollary in seabed law where countries have repeatedly looked into using land off their coast that they are legally allowed to use to get minerals off the bottom of the sea, and they decided not to do it. Uh, maybe it was because it was hard to make a profit. It's hard to know. But there were these huge environmental outcries. And so like the governments ended up saying, no, we don't want to piss people off. So I don't okay. think there's like, I, I, th I think if you want to model humans as goblins, that's a pretty good model, but it's not <laughs> unlimited. Okay, uh, I'm, gl I'm glad I, so, to have my cynicism yeah. dispelled about that. <laughs> Uh, that, that it actually is for concern about the environment of Antarctica. The same thing is happening on the deep seabed. So this is another international commons. So space, Antarctica, deep seabed, these are all international commons where we're all supposed to be sharing stuff. We know there are these polymetallic nodules down there, so they contain stuff that could be used to make, you know, like the batteries in a Tesla. Oh, I love polymetallic nodules. Well, That's doesn't? my favorite kind of nodule. Yeah, no, yeah. Who doesn't? I totally agree. I gotta so have them. <laughs> but, but we do have a system, uh, the International Seabed Authority, which is working through rules for like, can you extract them? How much can you extract? How do we share the wealth from that extraction with other countries? Because you're extracting from the global commons. And they do seem to be caring about environmental concerns. And they're moving very slowly as they work through these concerns. Um, so, you know, I don't think we immediately just drop laws when we dis discover there's money to be made. Um, but I agree with Zach. Yeah. They are mostly goblins, but not 100%. To, to, to circle it back to space, though, and this, this is a thing like, as far as I know, we're the only book that really hammers on this a lot, which is people hear space law and they're like, oh, it's some stupid law we're going to get rid of because Elon and me are going moon to, to Mars. And like, if you look at the post-1945 era, there have been three places we accessed with technology and inhabited, or not inhabited, but accessed with technology and could have made money on, which are the seabed. Uh, that is the open international waters, bottom of the sea. There's Antarctica and there's outer space, which like just Antarctica and the seabed is more than half of the surface of the earth. And in all three cases, we set up a commons like big wimps. It's not like the 19th century. We all think it's going to be like the 19th century where we plant a flag and start shooting and killing people. But that's not what we did. But, you know, the international rules based order is really nice. It's really cool. <laughs> and everybody thinks it's stupid and bureaucratic and wants to get rid of it because it like isn't awesome. But like, it's great. It stopped. Like, who knows what would happen if we had a scramble over these places? Yeah. Like, there's a whole 15 percent of Antarctica is unclaimed. Do you imagine that happening in the 19th century? OK, I, so you have really dispelled my cynicism <laughs> that we actually we actually have people are making rules that are hopefully largely prudent and following the rules because it's better for everybody yeah. and cooler heads are prevailing so far. Uh, for the time right. being. Right, I said so far. So far. For yes. the time yes. being. Yeah. So can we, yeah, we, we can we can roll that back. So the one thing, we, one thing that scares us about space, so I think space is somewhere where you could legitimately say part of the piece is that it's so hard to operate, right? There's just, it's, it's been hard, historically hard to get in fights because who gives a shit? But like, so a lot of players want to go to the moon now right? And the moon is big, but the parts of it that are valuable are tiny. Mm. The parts of it that are actually good for settlement are tiny. Actually, Kelly can explain this better than I can. Yeah, Do you so wanna... If you want to go to the moon to start a settlement, you need to be at the poles. So at the poles, there are areas where there, there are these craters that the sunlight never hits the center of, and that's where you find the water. So anywhere that sunlight hits, water gets vaporized and lost in the vacuum of space, but it is a solid ice chunk in those craters. And on the rims of those wow. craters, you can also set up solar panels that get sunlight 
something like 80 to 93% of the time, which is way better than the equator where you have a solid two week chunk of night. So like earth two weeks is night. We do not have the batteries to handle yes. that if you're running on solar power. But these areas are like the size of a handful of like, I don't know, 200 acre farms or something. They're not huge. And you could, they're very tiny. tiny. You could very easily like set up, uh, set up a couple research stations and essentially be like, Hey, these are ours. Like we know we weren't, you know, we're not sovereign over it. We're not saying that, but we're also not moving. And so there's no room for you. Yeah. And that could create problems. And so like, I think one way that space differs from Antarctica and the deep seabed is that it's way more tied to prestige than those other areas. Uh, and so I can imagine there being a, you yeah. know, a new space race with China. Some people say have said that this has already started over trying to, you know, get back to the moon. And well, not just some people, sorry, sorry, just a d- d- department of defense and like NASA heads, like it, people with power have said, it's not just like nerds like us. It's it's like people with a say have said, have so have said we are already in a race. We are already in a race to create a station like that, like in the very yeah. rare territory on the moon of in the middle of a crater on the North pole of the moon. Um, and it's such right. a shitty place it, it, to fight over. Like the water there is, there's not <laughs> that much of it to begin with. Like there's Stardust Lake, I think in Minnesota, yes. we need to remember the, the name of the state, but there's this, this human made lake uh, that nobody has heard of because it's that small. And that's how much water is estimated to be on the moon. It's not like Lake Superior or all the great lakes. It's a small amount. Yeah. And people, Fighting over a puddle. Yes. And, fighting over, and, and, and worse than that, like, like you, you hear people like big, very wealthy people and, and big government actors will be like, we've got to get the water first so that we can do X, Y, and Z. And you can't do X, Y, and Z because there's not that much water and it never replenishes. So it's, it's just literal bullshit. Oh, wait, it doesn't it's, well, replenish. No. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's go there. Yeah. So the moon is drier than concrete. There is a tiny number of places. So the moon has no atmosphere. Like, so if you throw a water balloon on the moon, the, that water just disperses. It's gone, right? In the space. Unless it's in the throw, space. Yeah, right. It, wow. Yeah, I mean, so, some of it might get bound up with some minerals, but basically it's gone. And so, but if you happen to throw it in a pitch black part of the moon under the rim of a crater, some of it will remain. And so over billions of years, that has happened when things like uh, have water in them smack into the moon. And so this is collected in these crater rims. But it's, it's a one-time deal. You can use it once at great difficulty, but set that aside. You can use it once and it's gone. It's it's just gone. And it doesn't come back. And the only other option is to cook uh, H2O out of uh, the surface. Which, so it's in there. There are these rocks called hydrates. But again, it's drier than concrete. So it's like baking concrete to get your daily water. Wow. You have to do like tons per day just to drink. Um, so it's, yeah. If I were, if I went to the moon, I'd drink all the water so fast because I'm like a really thirsty guy. <laughs> I'm always drinking and yeah. peeing and drinking <laughs> and peeing, especially after a long flight when I haven't slept. You know, I'm, I'm like super thirsty. I'm going to the bathroom all the time. So if I was on the moon, <laughs> like literally two days, all that water is gone. I'd be like, sorry guys. Well, so here's sure. the thing. You're, You're going to have to explain to the, the Chinese embassy right. that you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, I was on a plane no, all day. One guy showed up and he drank all <laughs> All the water on the moon. <laughs> Fuck. Well, this kind of back to our Biosphere 2 conversation. Like part of what those facilities are trying to figure out is how do you recycle water? So like on the International yeah. Space Station, uh, when they take a drink of water, they call it yesterday's coffee because they drank it as coffee. They pissed it out. They cleaned it. They drank it again. We're going to have to do stuff like that on space because you can't keep shipping water up from Earth. And so, you know, yeah. all that peeing that right. you're doing, that's what you're drinking tomorrow. And you're going to have to get good at recycling that yes. stuff. And there are people who propose setting up gas stations where you like split the water into hydrogen and oxygen and burn it as rocket fuel. And they're just burning the, you're never, you can't start a cylinder if you've burned all it's the gone. water away. Yeah. And I, I feel like they don't <laughs> recognize how little is there. And then, you know, you eat, you, you eat too much asparagus and then your water the next day tastes Everybody weird. Everybody hates gross. you for it. Yeah, no, it's awful. <laughs> it's more washing in it. It's funky. Not cool. <laughs> not cool. Okay, but but so there actually is like a space law issue at, at play here because somebody might want to go get that puddle of stinky water uh, before anybody else and just sort of like squat on the, on the property. L- literally squat. Yeah, yeah. So you can imagine, so, you know, uh, the, w- one thing we like to hit on is, is if you look at the space race of the 60s, it's a race to do something, not to take something. I mean, other than like some samples, whereas a space race, if we have it now, is everyone's talking about building a base. And so if you build a base on one of those crater rims, you are occupying a non-trivial portion because it's not just that your base is squatted. On the moon, the surface is this dangerous dust called regolith. If you put it under a microscope, it looks like tiny knives. 
Okay, it's not like regular dust. So you cannot land a rocket near that station, right? So if you plunk a station down under the Artemis Accords, a document put out by the US but signed by a lot of other powers, not including China, says you can set up what's called a safety zone, which is a sort of perimeter where they're not supposed to land. Wow. Um, so you're not claiming sovereignty, which is like a somewhat formal definition in international law, but you're sort of like, you're doing something. Yeah. Uh, that's in between. Yeah, you're, you're, oh, there's gotta be, there's like a board game or a video game that works this way where it's just like, oh, here's my first marker down and I got this amount of space and then someone else puts another yeah. marker down and if you put down three or four of those, like, well, holy shit, you just kind of ate up all the area. Exactly. Um, well, and, 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 and it, I would say it's like, it's very human sort of ape behavior. So you imagine like you set up a human, uh, a human base, Jesus. Uh, you set up a ape US base. base. What's an ape base like on the moon? <laughs> an ape base. Yeah, right. Well, that, that goes back to reproduction because we need to get the apes to do it first. Um, <laughs> but so you, 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 so suppose you set up your base and you're not sovereign over say a mile radius perimeter but suppose like you know over the generations like people say die in accidents and you have a graveyard right so you're, it's not american sovereignty but there are american bodies in the ground so the idea that some other country can come by and say move that is crazy even if, if even if outer space treaty kind of says they should there's no way you're going to do it right right so like like this is this is human ingrained territory turf stuff and it's dangerous and what's causing the the space race is it just literally to have the territory because because you're like well there's very little water you, you already said earlier yeah. that the scientific capability of doing this is probably not that large you know to, to have a human man settlement of some kind so what's the what, what would be the purpose of doing I mean, this? i think it's mostly prestige again so china has been you know yeah. putting up space stations they're up to their third now and so they're sort of trying they're working on getting the same capabilities that the u.s has had and now they're talking about having this lunar economy and the lunar economy is for things like extracting helium-3 to sell back on Earth, which is just absolutely ridiculous. And that's a whole rant that Zach could go on if you want him to go on it. But, but I think the fact that like China is going up there and talking about an economy is making the U.S. be like, OK, this is this is a new space race. They're doing it. Maybe we should be doing it, too. Yeah. And so I, I do mm -hmm. think it's all tied up in prestige. And I'm not convinced there's anything worth going there. Uh, you so gotta, I, I gotta, keep, add, you gotta oh, keep up with the Joneses. Oh, they got all that really luxurious helium three from the moon. Mm -hmm. It's like everyone's ooing and eyeing. Uh, you know, oh, their helium three is better than our helium three. And then so, and then before we yeah. know, it, we're on the way to the moon mall. No, you know, in I think it was 2019, uh, India blew up one of its own satellites, which is not that weird. It's just to show capability. And so you, nations do this from time to time. It's frowned on. Modi literally said that we have it in our book. I, don't, I won't get it verbatim, but he said something like India has declared itself a space power. Uh -huh. Like, that's it. That's what's going on. Um, and so, yeah, that's part of why we're we, so we argue there should be a really boring bureaucratic uh, space regulation agency that regulates these claims. Not because we think UN bureaucracies are awesome or dynamic or like are going to get us all to the moon sooner. We, it's just because we don't think there's actually anything worth doing on the moon for a money reason. There's nothing worth fighting over. There's no military advantage. It was looked into in the 60s. It's, it's bullshit. Well, and so far, peace has been maintained and we haven't destroyed Antarctica or the deep sea bed. And again, maybe that won't always be the case. But if you could do the same thing for space, that seems like it would be a win for us. So I uh, look, I love what you guys are doing because you are rigorously like testing, you know, what what can we do now? What could we do in the future? Is it possible? Is it worth doing? And your answers to most of those questions are no. <laughs> you're, you're just, you say, well, we're, we're in a race right now, but we probably shouldn't be because it's just for, it's, uh, you yeah. know, uh, comparing national dick size. Uh, what Elon is doing is like that. That's the work of many generations, which may be off in the future. And yada yada yada. I mean, what what excites you about about the prospect of of human space settlement? Well, so I, if anything, I should say, this isn't the book we thought we were going to write. Like one of our friends, we explained our book to him, and he's like, "You can't write the like the dream is dumb book. You you like that's not a book people are going to buy." Like, that's, I'm I'm the intended audience for that book. I'll buy that book. <laughs> well, we hope there's yeah. more of you. But so you know, we thought we. we I love the idea of humans in space and humans being a multiplanetary species. I'm a sci-fi nerd. It sounded awesome to me. It still sounds awesome to me, but I think we need to be way more careful about how we do it. And so, and I'm, you know, totally down for yeah. exploring space. I'd like to, you know, I love seeing rovers on Mars and on the moon. Uh, you know, I still have a lot of like joy in my life, but I, I do happen to be a bit of a, a wet <laughs> like it. And it's pretty solid down here on earth too. But what do you want to add, Zach? What, what do you like? <laughs> 
Uh, you know, I was just going to say when, when when you said national dick measuring contest, there's an actual story from the first time the Russians and Americans docked with each other that each refused to be the female dock. Uh, uh, and so they, uh, <laughs> they John Young, John Young, who was an astronaut who and engineer who worked on it, said the phrase he used was nobody wanted to be getting the business. And so and so they they literally had to design an androgynous docking mechanism. And the, what I love about that story, too, is that Young said it worked better, which I feel like there's a, there's a sort of beautiful lesson right. embedded in there. Things right. work yeah. better. Uh, it also crossed. Things money. work better when no one's getting <laughs> fucked. Right. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's right. No one needs but, to get fucked. They, we can, that's right. We can just. Um, we can just. Uh, uh, I won't. I won't go further down the metaphor. <laughs> yeah, that's that's good. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. But but so um, what I wanted to say is, uh, separate from settlement, like th there's so much awesome stuff we can do, even in a framework where there's a big, boring international bureaucracy, and we're not doing Elon Musk plans. So like, on the moon, we talked about the awesome places on the moon. The other thing than those poles is lava tubes. So you know, you know how in Hawaii there are lava tube caves. There are these giants. Case you can go into, they almost look like cathedrals. And what's happened is like lava flowed through and went on and left this sort of crust behind. So those exist on the moon. There are these ancient lava tubes. They may be hundreds of times larger than anything on Earth. Whoa. There's like just a, objectively amazing. Like I, there's probably no return investment other than sending rich people there. But like, I don't know. Like you want to talk about science that we do just because it's cool? Like send a robot in there, send a guy in there, whatever. Like, so there's like, you know, just saying. There's a lot of problems with on mass human space settlement and people like like random space billionaires being able to do whatever they want. That's a problem. But there's so much cool stuff you can do within the existing framework that's exciting and uplifting and like, you know, not sad and pathetic and miserable like we're. Uh, but then you have about. to ask, would it be worth, you know, 4% of the national budget, right? Like uh, you have this, there's yeah. this argument of, uh, you know, space. We we had a researcher on Adam Ruins Everything one year, uh, very uh, very great researcher named Natalie Schur, who pitched the idea. We did not do this topic, but she pitched the idea: space sucks. We shouldn't go there. Not worth the time. Not worth the money. If we were to devote all those resources to our yeah. own planet, right? Um, we we would. Uh, that's the way to save humanity. Ooh, yeah. That's the way to uh, you know uh, improve human flourishing. That's the backup plan we actually yeah. need. Are you guys amenable to that argument, or do you think it's Hey, humans are always going to want to go explore. So, so, you know, it's always going to fall on deaf ears. So what I would say, I, th I think the first person I heard may make this argument was Mary Roach, who wrote a great book called Packing for Mars, mm. um, which, which kind of inspired this book. And she said uh, very astutely, the way that like these big budgets work, it's not as if you pull money from NASA, it automatically goes to really good science. Or to feeding right? hungry people. So like, or, or to feeding hungry people or whatever like nice cause you wanted to, or even like lowering taxes. Like it's not like, like the budget is this giant thing that we handle politically. So it's all well and good to say it'd be better to take NASA's 20 billion bucks yep. and like eliminate poverty for a lot of people. It's just not, it's just not how the budget works. If it did, I think there'd be a great argument for well, it. And there's the additional argument that unfortunately we as a society do not want to eliminate poverty. If we actually wanted to, <laughs> we would have done yeah. it, right? Like you can say, hey, we have all this money. When we say we have all this money, we have all this food, we could eliminate hunger and poverty, right? Why don't we do yeah. it is always the implication. Well, the answer is not, oh, geez, we just forgot and we accidentally spent all the money on other shit. No, the answer is right. we don't want to eliminate poverty. You might individually want to. I might individually want to. But as a society, somebody doesn't want right. to. Those people have the power. And until we change that. So, so it's sort of pointless to, you know, argue, oh, what if we shifted the money over? Because yeah, we would, we would yeah. spend it on something else fucking stupid. Like if you, if you said, Hey, billionaire, you can't buy a yacht. They're not gonna say, okay, you're right. Let me just uh, spend the money on some poor people who need it. No, nah, they're going to buy, <laughs> they're going to buy a gigantic, I don't know, land cruiser yeah. or something. They're going to buy some other fucking yeah. billionaire shit because they're a selfish asshole and they have the money. Yeah. <laughs> so you yeah. Know. anyway, sorry, go on. No, no, I'm, I'm basically just sitting here nodding my head. Uh, you know, the, 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 the example I really like is in the 90s, there was a project called the Superconducting Super Collider. Oh, yeah. It would have been three times more powerful than the LHC. I think it was going to be outside Dallas. It would have been like, you know, supersymmetry with a Texas accent. Yeah. Uh, it would have been awesome. 
And it was canceled for, for reasons like what you're describing. And I don't think anyone believes that that uh, extra $20 billion immediately went to poverty or even like right. lowering taxes. Or, and or that this. was actually so, scientifically very valuable. It could have been. Um, but I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. But instead, the money just went to normal government shit. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, some of which is good and some of which is, is maybe bad. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean. Like what, how do you suggest people feel about this? Because, you know, one of the problems with this conversation is that, you know, it is so often used to weaponize people's optimism and idealism, right? That's, that's a lot of what, I mean, look, people at some point are going to come into my comments and say, if you hate Elon so much, why do you keep talking about him and guilty, <laughs> uh, fair accusation. But <laughs> one of the things that bothers me about the guy, especially in his first sort of 10 years of his career was he weaponized people's optimism, right? He said, we are going to change the world. We can do it. We're going to use engineering and science and math to make the world a better place. And then over the course of the decade, we realized, Oh, this guy's making himself rich. He's hurting a lot of people. And you know, he's done a couple nice things, but he's also full of shit. Right. But um, that story that he told in many ways was so powerful to people and it gave people something important. I remember that feeling of going, oh, my God, like, wow, we could really do this stuff. Right. If, you know, oh, this guy's spending money on electric cars and whatnot. And uh, and what yeah. a great positive thing for the world. Um, and so uh, I, I don't know. Is, 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 can, <laughs> is it hard to. Dispel this stuff. Go He's for it. tapping into a long tradition of techno utopianism as it relates to space. So for yeah. a for as yeah. long as people have been talking about space, so Konstantin Solkovsky was part of this biocosmism move movement. He came up with the rocket equation. This is long before we had rockets in space, and space was going to perfect everything. We were going to bring back the dead. We were all going to have all of space to live, so we'd be all harmonious. It would be awesome. So like this has been a problem for space from from the beginning of our dreams about space. People have always oversold space, and I think you know the anecdote is information. The anecdote is our book. Uh, but no, like if you know you should read about it. You should think critically about these things. And you know, like oh, how few things in life are black and white. And most of the things that you're told about why space is going to be awesome don't hold up when you look at the numbers. You know, I think my favorite example is uh, for a while the rotating space station people were saying we could solve overpopulation by sending people to space. But we put on enough people every year that you'd have to literally send 220 thousand people to space every day just to tread water. So we're not going to take care of overpopulation. We don't have rockets that can even take more than like, what, three people to space right now. We don't know how to make these habitats. And so, you know, I think when you hear one of these claims, you just need to sit back and think about like, OK, what is what are the assumptions in this claim and do they make sense? But all that said, do you guys uh, want to go to space? <laughs> <laughs> no. Hell no. Oh, wow. I'm saying okay. Listen, listen. No, like, here's why. Well, first of all, like, so I was, I was reading, there's a proposal by Donald Rapp, who's a, a kind of like crotchety guy, but he was, he was part of the, the Moxie project for breaking CO2 on Mars, uh, which was done recently. It was very successful. He said he thought if you sent people to, the, to Mars on a mission around now, you could at best say they'd have, I think he said, like a 92% chance of survival, which is not a good percent. That's not high enough for um, me. No. <laughs> no, I'm not sitting no, around rolling, uh, uh, rolling, you know, 2D10, <laughs> trying to figure out what my, you know, hoping I, hoping I don't get a nine on the first yeah. one. I'm glad you had those, those stats offhand. That's very impressive. Uh, I play. I play. But, but uh, yeah, but no, I, I, I wouldn't go now. It's much too dangerous. Um, uh, I yeah, really like it. Earth, it's, it's, though. I mean, can I, can I? Yeah, yeah, Earth is great. Um, you know, well, uh, but um, the, you know, the, the thing with, like, in terms of this techno optimism stuff, like, some, something like, in, like, in terms of the human future, one thing I'm interested in is this idea of, like, under what circumstances is this a good idea? And essentially, we argue like there's a lot of technical stuff to work out. There's also a lot of human harmony that has to be worked out to make this not a dangerous activity. There's also, you know, just these huge developments we would need in things like robotics. So to my mind, settling Mars is something we do when we're like in Star Trek universe. It's not something we do now for any purported social benefit or economic benefit because it's just not there. It's something we do eventually when we are very rich and very advanced and very harmonious. And that's 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 what is is likely to be the case. And it's what should be the case. In the meantime, we can have a lot of fun doing the thought experiments, plotting it out, talking about all the things that could happen if we were to try too soon. It's been a blast talking to both of you. Uh, the name of the book is A City on Mars. You can pick it up at factuallypod.com slash books, which is our special bookshop. Um, but uh, where else can people find you on the Internet? Uh 
If you search Wiener Smith, you're only going to find us, Zach. Uh, uh, <laughs> so there you go. There's <laughs> nobody making hot dogs somewhere who's who's using the name. There's a Wiener hyphen Smith who's an obstetrician. Good for her. She's helping people fit the wieners, <laughs> yeah. but we're the only ones where it's all one word, as far as I know. And our kids, bless their Love hearts. It. That's right. <laughs> Thank uh, Kelly and Zach. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been an absolute blast. Thanks. We had a blast too. Thanks. This is fun. Well, thank you so much to Dr. Kelly and Zach Wiener Smith for coming on the show. Once again, if you want to pick up a copy of their book, head to factuallypod.com slash books. That's factuallypod.com slash books. If you want to support this show, head to patreon.com slash Adam Conover. Five bucks a month gets you every episode of this show ad free for 15 bucks a month. Your name will go in the credits of every single one of my video monologues, and I will read your name in this podcast. This week, I want to thank Richard McVeigh, Emily Wilson, Lee Dotson, Blamo, and Michael Frasco. Thank you so much for your support. Once again, to remind you, if you want to come see me do stand up comedy in New York City, Chicago, Atlanta, Philly, Nashville, Boston, D.C., and other cities, head to adamconover.net for tickets and tour dates. I want to thank my producers, Sam Radman and Tony Wilson, everybody here at HeadGum for helping make this show possible. Look at this beautiful New York City studio we're recording in right now. What a wonderful group of people. Love working with them. And we'll see you next week on Factually. That was a HeadGum podcast.